from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Library of Congress. I have the great honor and pleasure as head of the library's new division, National and International Outreach, of welcoming you here this evening for the Living Legend Award. First of all, I want to acknowledge members of the diplomatic community who are with us tonight. Among them are a number of diplomats from countries that have figured large in the life and career of our awardee, Mario Vargas Llosa. Please welcome Ambassador Luis Miguel Castilla of Peru. I cannot <laughs> Spain's Ambassador Roma, uh, Rom, Ramon Gil Casares. <laughs> The Mexican Ambassador, Miguel Basanez. <laughs> Ambassador Martin Lusto of Argentina. <laughs> Sweden's Deputy Chief of Mission, Goran Littel. and the former ambassador from the United States to Peru, Ambassador Alexander Watson. We are delighted to have all of you join us for this happy occasion. I also want to welcome our most recent Living Legend awardee whose award was conferred last November. She is a vibrant force in the musical world, the prodigiously talented Marta Castel Zestoman. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to recognize the individual responsible for this award, the man who has played a pivotal role in naming the living legends for the last 16 years, Librarian of Congress Emeritus James H. Billington. Thank you also to the distinguished novelists and scholars who informed us so richly about Mario Vargas Llosa's work in this afternoon's symposium. You'll find their names listed in your program. They've come a long way to pay homage to this awardee. Let's give them a big hand. <clears throat> The Living Legend Award was inaugurated 16 years ago, in the year 2000, exactly 200 years after the formation of the Library of Congress. The then Librarian of Congress, James Billington, was seeking a way to mark the library's bicentennial by celebrating artists, scholars, and professionals across disciplines, individuals who had made lasting impressions on American culture. Their fields might be science, or literature, or medicine, or the media, or politics, or entertainment, or the fine arts. It didn't matter, but their work needed to be trailblazing in some way. Transformational, electric, enduring. And their contributions had to say something important about what it means to be American, and what it means for Americans to be citizens of the world. This is why we are gathered here tonight, to celebrate the many accomplishments of a writer who's had a profound effect on the American reading public, the Peruvian novelist and essayist, Marias Vargas Llosa. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we offer a brief history of this remarkable writer. Let's roll the video, please. If anything can be said to define Mario Vargas Llosa, 
It is his passion for words, a passion that leaps exuberantly from genre to genre, from spoken to written works. He is best known for his fiction, which can be spirited, whimsical, or deadly serious. His novels are well known for exposing human frailties and plumbing dark chapters of human history. But fiction is not his only domain. He has excelled in theater, journalism, literary criticism, opinion. He has given us drama, memoir, critical essays, social and political commentary, scholarly argument, literary scholarship. And he has done so with rare intellectual vigor and a keen appreciation of the human heart. He learned to read at the age of five in a Catholic school in Cochabamba, Bolivia, where he and his mother were living at the time. It was reading, he says, that opened the door to a life of writing. Jorge Mario Pedro Vargas Llosa was born on March 28, 1936, in Arequipa, Peru. But he spent his early childhood years in Bolivia, where he was raised by his mother and his grandfather, a Peruvian diplomat. He moved to Pura, Peru, when he was 10, and shortly thereafter his parents, who had been divorced before he was born, were reunited and resettled in Lima. When Mario was 14, his father sent him to the military academy that became the inspiration for his novel, The Time of the Hero. It was there, steeped in the rigors of military life, that Vargas Llosa developed the second greatest passion of his career, a deep regard for freedom. Even as he was being prepared for a military career, he began working for local newspapers, first in Lima at the age of 16, and then in Piura. In 1952, he saw his first play, The Flight of the Inca, come to life on stage in Piura. It was the beginning of a lifelong love affair with storytelling. Convinced that his future was in words, he decided to study law and literature at the University of San Marcos in Lima. While still a student, he married his first wife, Julia Urquidi, at the age of 19. Graduating from San Marcos in 1958, he won a scholarship to study at Complutense University in Madrid, where he received a doctorate in philosophy and literature. He went on to Paris, hoping to win another scholarship there, and when those hopes were dashed, he began writing stories in earnest. To make ends meet, he worked as a reporter for Agence France Presse and the French National Television Network. It was in Paris, he says, that he began reading literature from other Latin American countries and eventually met the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, the Cuban novelist Alejo Carpentier, and the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges. In Paris, too, Vargas Llosa became part of the historic flourishing of literature now known as the Latin American boom a cadre of brilliant young writers who inspired one another to write the landmark Latin American masterpieces of the 60s and 70s. They were Gabriel Garcia Marquez, José Donoso, Jorge Edwards, Carlos Fuentes, Julio Cortázar, and, of course, Mario Vargas Llosa. Within a few years, they would all be read in English and translated into languages around the world. Vargas Llosa's first published work, a collection of short stories, was received favorably, but it was his first novel, The Time of the Hero, published in 1963, with its penetrating portrait of an entrenched military establishment in Peru, that earned him a coveted prize in Spain and an immediate place among the most celebrated young writers of Latin America. His first marriage dissolved at about that time, and he married his cousin, Patricia Llosa, by whom he would eventually have three children, Álvaro, Gonzalo, and Morgana. His second novel, The Green House, about a legendary brothel for soldiers in the Peruvian jungle, won him even more accolades and readers. 
Every book since has been a departure from the one before, alternating from humorous, even erotic, flights of fancy to pivotal questions of history. He has given us, in all, more than a dozen unforgettable novels and a wide variety of nonfiction. Among these are Conversation in the Cathedral, Captain Pantoja and the Special Service, Aunt Julia and the Scriptwriter, The War at the End of the World, Who Killed Palomino Molero, In Praise of the Stepmother, Death in the Andes, A Fish in the Water, the Notebooks of Don Rigoberto, Letters to a Young Novelist, The Feast of the Goat, The Way to Paradise, The Bad Girl, The Dream of the Celt, and most recently, The Discreet Hero. For this remarkably diverse work in letters, he has been awarded all the major literary prizes in Spain and Latin America. He has been decorated by France, Mexico, Peru, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic. He has been accorded a title of Spanish nobility. He has been awarded the Nobel Prize. But these contributions are not confined to the pages of his books. For many decades now, this writer and thinker has been a tireless participant on the world stage. He has taught at a number of prominent universities throughout Europe and the United States. He has participated in theatrical works, not only as writer or director, but as actor. He has taken an active part in world commentary, whether it be about arts, politics, or culture. He has lectured widely about the relevance of the arts in human life. He has been president of Penn International. He has run a vigorous campaign for the presidency of his native land. Mario Vargas Llosa has, in short, been a passionate, vibrant force, not only in the realm of the imagination and ideas, but in the larger sphere of human affairs. If the Library of Congress's Living Legend Award is meant to honor those who have made significant contributions to our cultural heritage, then Mario Vargas Llosa is eminently deserving of this prize. There are few who have done so much to bring luster to Spanish language letters and enrich culture in the 20th and 21st centuries. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ambassador of Peru to the United States of America, Luis Miguel Castilla. I'm truly honored to be part of this important celebration. First of all, I would like to thank the Library of Congress for generally hosting us this evening on the occasion of bestowing a special recognition upon Mario Vargas Llosa. I would also like to acknowledge a brilliant Peruvian novelist and journalist, Maria Arana, who has been instrumental in putting together this important event. Gracias, Maria. Indeed, this time, Mario Vargas Llosa is being given the prestigious Levin Living Legend Award which the Library of Congress confers upon prominent figures whose career have made an impact in a unique and creative way in the American community, contributing to its development and its diverse cultural heritage. Mario, who received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2010, is making history again, this time in the United States, receiving a distinction previously conferred to artists, writers, thinkers, social activists, politicians, and even sport figures, thereby joining his name with that of the influential economist John Kenneth Galbraith and the no less significant political scientist George Keegan, the accomplished photographer Annie Leibovitz, the brilliant guitarist B.B. King, 
among many others. This is undoubtedly a unique award honoring distinguished figures who contribute to the endeavors of a community with deeply rooted traditions and values of its own and upon which it has emerged as one of the most influential living cultures in the world. I am very proud as a fellow Peruvian of Mario's accomplishments, which have contributed to placing very high the name of our country, not only in the US, but around the world. In this particular case, the fact of being in, the, in one of the most important libraries in the world, in the heart of Washington, and in one of the most vibrant democracies in the planet, demonstrates the importance of Mario's work while acknowledging his personal qualities and a lifetime struggle for democratic values and freedom. Mario Vargas Llosa has proven to be a great promoter of the Peruvian culture. Through Mario's books, one can learn about a complex and fascinating country like Peru. In his books, such as La Ciudad y los Perros, Pantaleón y las Visitadoras, and La Casa Verde, among many others, readers discover a mysterious country with overlapping, conflicting, and sometimes contradictory realities, representing exceptional testimonies of the variety, wealth, and diversity of Peru. On a personal note, as many Peruvians of my generation, I have learned a great deal from Mario's novels, spending hours devouring his books, and learning about our own history, its richness and paradoxes. As him, I grew up in Miraflores. My father attended his same Leoncio Parado military school. The first play I ever attended was La Señorita de Tacna 30, 35 years ago. And the first time I personally met Mario was almost five years ago during a brilliant presentation at the Cervantes Institute in New York City. In all truth, I have been captivated throughout my life by his storytelling and his skillful capabilities of enthralling his readers page after page, transporting them from the streets of Santo Domingo in La Fiesta de Chivo to Lima's old Barrios Altos quarter in his most recent novel, Cinco Esquinas. Not only has Mario's literary work been important, but also his outstanding journalistic work throughout his life. From his first articles in local newspapers like La Cronica and La Industria, through his, his recognized Piedra de Toque column published in more than 20 countries, Mario comes across as a keen observer of the reality of our times and with his sharp pen convinces us again and again of the importance of freedom and democratic values, deeply analyzing global current affairs from his unique perspective. And as Mario once stated, I quote, it is very difficult for a Latin American writer to avoid politics. Literature is an expression of life and you cannot eradicate politics from life. Ladies and gentlemen, a few days ago, on the occasion of celebrating Mario's 80th birthday, a seminar was held in Madrid, Barraciosa, Culture, Ideas, and Freedom, during which Spain's president, Mariano Rajoy, said that Mario, I quote, embodies the reaffirmation of freedom and rejection of indifference. Adding that, quote, he's our only Nobel Prize laureate alive and is a hero of the freedom that has made Latin America, Spain, and the Hispanic community big in the world. I cannot agree more with the remarks of President Rajoy. Mario is an example cautioning us of the danger of falling into the illusion of thinking from the comfort of our homes that the benefits we enjoy in the free world are already established and everlasting, when the truth is that it is necessary to fight for them every day. People like Mario are those who wage these battles. This is what I consider the main value of Mario Vargas Llosa's liter literary and journalistic work, which cautions and encourages never to stop fighting for what we believe is right and valuable, not only in terms of ourselves, our community, but also of humankind at large. Muchas gracias, Mario.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Acting Librarian of Congress, David Mao. Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Ambassador Castilla, for those wonderful remarks. It's an honor to have you and others from the Diplomatic Corps join us this evening for this wonderful ceremony. We're very, very delighted to have so many folks here to help us celebrate this evening. Friends, family, all of those who have played a part in the life and career of tonight's living legend awardee, Mario Vargas Llosa. Now, this may be the first time for many of you to be here at the Library of Congress, so I want to take a few seconds and tell you a little bit about us. We are the library that was founded in 1800 for Congress. But when we were founded in 1800, we were a small reference library for the members of Congress, for members of Congress, just a few books and some maps. But over the last 216 years, we have grown to become the world's largest library with more than 162 million items, including 32 million books in over 470 languages. And quite a few of them uh, belong to our awardee tonight. We also have over 60 million manuscripts, millions of maps, films, newspapers, sheet music, photographic images, and prints, all part of our comprehensive collection of the culture of the world and the United States. Now, of particular note, the library has a magnificent collection of Latin American and Luso-Hispanic treasures. And these collections are highlighted quite often in our exhibits, in our publications, in our reading rooms, and in our many free public events like those today. So I hope today's program, this evening's program, and the symposia from this afternoon uh, inspires you to come back often to visit us again and again. Now it is my great pleasure and privilege to award to Mario Vargas Llosa the Library of Congress Living Legend Award. A prize, as you have heard mentioned this evening, is one that honors those who have contributed greatly to the cultural life of Americans. And since the library's bicentennial in 2000, we have conferred this award on just select individuals who have inspired the American public through exemplary work. In their fields, uh, they've left great legacies to the world. And certainly, Mario Vargas Llosa is one of those select individuals. As Dr. James Billington, now the Librarian of Congress Emeritus, put it, uh, and I should say that we are very, very delighted to have Librarian of Congress Emeritus and Mrs. Billington with us here this evening. They worked tirelessly together for almost 30 years for this great institution. And yes, thank you very much. And we're so proud that we can continue his uh, vision of awarding a Living Legend uh, Award here tonight. So this is what Dr. Billington said about our awardee tonight. And I quote, he is a writer in every sense of the word, a novelist, a scholar, a public intellectual, a playwright, an essayist, a literary critic, most importantly, a teacher. And he's a brilliant champion of the Latin American experience. Mr. Vargas Llosa has produced a vast amount of groundbreaking work in the realm of letters and literary criticism. He's a thinker who has greatly broadened the cultural conversation in this hemisphere. And during a very long career, he has entertained us, delighted us, and informed us as only a great novelist can do. His fiction reveals a profound understanding of the human spirit and the human heart, and the logic and illogic of the Latin American character. His essays and nonfiction work have tried to clarify a continent's realities, its politics, its quirks, and its hierarchies, its triumphs, and its tragedies. He has brought South American history to life and shown us the ways that history lives on in all of its inheritance. Mario, Mario Vargas Llosa is, in short, a unique spokesman for the Americas, a literary force whose fiction and nonfiction works have stimulated readers in a multitude of languages and whose legacy is bound to last for many generations to come. We at the Library of Congress are very, very proud to confer this tribute on him. So please join me in welcoming and celebrating Mario Vargas Llosa as we invite him to the stage this evening.
At this time, we have a very special part of the program. We will have an interview of Mr. Vargas Llosa. And to do that, I want to welcome Marie Arana, wonderful author, literary critic, and currently the chair of the Cultures of the Countries of the South here at the Library of Congress's John W. Kluge Center. So please welcome Marie Arana to the stage. Congratulations to, to Mario. Thank you. Um, this is a very special, um, well, Mario, it's a very great pleasure for me for a million reasons uh, to have you win this award. Thank you very much. It, um, as a Peruvian American, as someone who has spent her lifetime in books and who, who has admired you and known you for so many years. Absolutely. Um, it is a, a really a very special moment for me, and I'm very grateful to be here to have this conversation with you. Uh, these last few years have brought many reasons to celebrate uh, you, uh, the Nobel, of course. There have been many prizes, among them the, uh, a prize for the citizen of Madrid, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, not to mention the singular honor of being chosen as an author of La Bibliothèque de la Pléiade, mm -hmm. which is a tre tremendous honor, uh, who, among whose ranks are the distinguished authors such as André Gide and, uh, and Milan Kundera and André Malraux. And um, so you, have, you, you are now in this extraordinary uh, rank uh, and have been called the most important um, writer of your generation in Latin America. So now you have to add to these uh, tributes the Library of Congress Living Legend Award. And I want to ask you, what does, it, what, what does it mean to you? Could you tell us a little bit about what it means to you, number one, to have the Living Legend Award, and number two, in, in a more general way, to receive this from the Library of Congress, which you know so well for so many years? Well, I am deeply grateful, Maria, of course, to the Library of Congress for honoring me with this uh, Living Legend Award. Um, it's very generous. I, I don't think I, I deserve it. Legion is something so big, so permanent, uh, that I don't, I don't really feel that uh, I can become a living uh, legion. Living, yes, living, <laughs> I think I am living, but not, not a legion. It's just generosity of the Library of Congress, and of course I am very grateful. I know that to receive an award is also to receive a mandate, a mandate of rigor, of responsibility, in what you do, in what you write, in what you say as a public uh, uh, intellectual. And of course, uh, what can I say? It's uh, that I will do my best to not disappoint you and not to be too far away of what this medal, this living legend award signifies. Uh, you know, Maria, uh, writing is a solitary business. We, you are a writer yourself, so you know that in order to write, we as isolate ourselves. And uh, we cut, in a, in a way, with the uh, environment, because this is the only way in which we can uh, produce this alternative reality, which is the literary uh, fiction. Uh, and um, usually writers work in total uncertainty about what is going to happen with what you write afterwards, when uh, it becomes a book and uh, reach the, the readers. In that sense, you know, to receive a public recognition, as it is uh, the case of a literary award, is something 
extremely encouraging because uh, it means, you, you want this to mean that what you do, sometimes with great effort and uh, spending a lot of, of time and energy in what you, you do, um, is not useless. It's something that reach uh, the mind, the heart of certain people and uh, maybe help these people to live. This is what is great about books, you know. I, I learned to read when I was five years old and I remember how life became so rich, so uh, intense, uh, uh, the way in which uh, uh, my, my life became a permanent adventure, you know, something that was extremely much more uh, important than the, the real life that I, that, I, that I had. So if this is something that we can produce in our effort of communicate with the, with the readers, is of course the best reward that a writer can receive. No? Absolutely. Well, you say something very important about writing. Of course, there's no more solitary experience in the world than being a writer mm -hmm. and working alone and, 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 and setting down your thoughts alone. But there's also a, the solitary experience of being a reader. Mm -hmm. And what is, has always been extraordinary to me is that a book is an inanimate subject. It's, it, it doesn't mean anything until somebody picks it up. And there is that bridge created between you and the reader. Mm -hmm. So it's an extraordinary thing to me that you point out the, solid, the, the, soli the, the, soli the solitary nature of um, writing, which is also very true for the reader, do you mm -hmm. not think? Oh, yes. Uh, I think it's uh, a great mystery for a writer uh, to think in what will happen when the book that you are writing reaches the, the readers. If the book reaches the readers, because sometimes it doesn't, no? Uh, sometimes there is a feeling of failure. No? Uh, I always think in the tragic case of Giuseppe de Lampedusa, uh, a very great writer. I think that he, he wrote one of the greatest uh, novels of the 20th century, El Gato Pardo. He worked very hard in this masterwork. And then when he finished, he was a very cultivated man. With the, uh, he sp spoke several languages, and he had written beautiful essays about the English writers, for example. And he tried to find a publisher for his book. And seven, the seven most important publishing houses of Italy rejected his book. And then he died before his book was published. So I always think in his case, as the most tragic case, mm. He wrote a masterwork, a real masterwork, a very great, great novel. And he couldn't find a publisher. And when the book was published, because Giorgio, Giorgio Bassani, as a, an Italian writer, finally discovered the manuscript and said, well, but this is a masterwork. But this book should be published. And effectively, the book was published. And the book became immediately, immediately a bestseller and everybody recognized in El Gato Pardo a real masterwork. So what a tragic case, yes. what a sad story, you know? Yes, thank so you. So some writers, as we are very fortunate, you know, to be recognized and, uh, uh, and it's difficult not to think in all these colleagues, these fellow writers who were not so fortunate as us and sometimes as the case of, uh, as is the case of uh, Giuseppe de Lampedusa were tragically uh, rejected because the blindness of his contemporary mm. con contemporary people. Absolutely, this is the important part of being, as you said, living is mm. a very <laughs> important part of this award. <laughs> I want to talk about the breadth 
of your work. Um, what, what is really most remarkable to me about your career, Mario, and it's surely remarkable to everyone who's sitting in this audience, is that very fact, the breadth, the range of uh, the, the video gave us a, uh, a notion of that range. Um, although it did leave out your most recent novel, Cinco Esquinas, because Cinco Esquinas, we, we, yeah. we didn't know it would publish in time for this. But your writing spans from, as it says, from fiction to drama, to journalistic opinion, to political commentary, to literary criticism. And in fiction alone, it ranges from novels of ideas to picaresque novels to thrillers and mysteries and, and novels that are set in 20th century history in a, very, in a most uh, kind of stark and powerful way. In other words, you wear many hats as a writer. There are many hats that you wear, and you have learned to wear all of them uh, in, in sort of an extraordinarily um, masterly fashion. Um, which of those hats would you say represents the true Mario Vargas Llosa? Oh, I think all my books represent what I am, you know. Uh, well, Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, said something that I think is very, very uh, real. That when you look yourself at a mirror, you don't know how is your face. Mm. Others know immediately and say, well, you are awful, you are very handsome, and, uh, but you don't know. And I think that is what happens, at least to me, with my books. I don't know the real value of my books. Uh, I work very hard, I enjoy, I suffer sometimes writing these books, but I never know exactly what I have uh, achieved, you know, with, this, with these books. Uh, even when a book has some success and receives uh, good reviews, uh, uh, you are never sure mm. if this is uh, exactly what the book represents. Because you know that the only way would be to wait, uh, to wait if this book, these books um, are able to transcend the, the proof of time which I think is what definitely decides if what you have done is worthwhile or not. No? There's also some, uh, um, a phenomenon that happens, I think, when you release a book into the world. Is there not that you have act actually no, no concept of how it will be received, and people will receive it in very many different ways. Very different ways. And you hear course. about this then from them, from the audience. How has that experience been for you? Well. What has happened to me several times is that the, the book may be successful or not, but in general, the way in which the book is received is very surprising. But in many, many cases, the idea that I had of the book doesn't coincide with the, with the way in which the book was received by critics or by, the, by, by, by just uh, readers, you know? Um, and I suppose the reason is because the example of Borges and the mirror is that. You don't really know exactly what you have achieved when you uh, write a book. Um, you would like to be successful. You would like this book to uh, justify all the uh, time that you have in invested and the energy that you have invested in, in writing it. But actually, you never know. And this is the great enigma, I think, that all writers uh, have respect of his, uh, their own work. Absolutely, absolutely. You have thought um, deeply, Mario, about power. And um, here you are in the heart of of Washington, which represents political power, at least in this country. And this is something that, judging by your works, whether they be serious or funny, or whether they be large scale or intimate, um, or whether they even be historical or set in the modern day, it concerns you. Power concerns you. That 
concern was present in the greenhouse. It was present in the conversation in the cathedral, to be sure. Um, present in the Feast of the Goat, War of the Worlds. We can go th right through it. Um, and it is really in very special evidence, I think, in your most recent novel, Cinco Esquinas. Um, what is it that draws you to power? Uh, well, I think that literature in general is something that represents uh, a kind of counter power. It's something that um, uh, the authors not necessarily know, but I think a very good book, a good novel, a good play, um, a good poem, is something that defend us rivers against the potential danger that there is in all kind of power. I think the, the power is something that potentially uh, represents a, a kind of danger for things like freedom, uh, human rights, uh, uh, the, the basic rights of the, of the individual. And we are not always aware of this. And I think there is nothing like literature to make you aware of the dangers that the different kind of powers that uh, are, are around us represent. Uh, and I think that is the, the most important, important social function of literature, to develop in us a kind of uh, uh, critical attitude, to critical spirit, uh, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the powers that uh, organize society and establish, you know, the, the institutions that uh, uh, rule, you know, the, the, the life in, in, in society. For that reason, I think literature is extremely important, not only because the pleasure that we receive from, from books, from uh, achieved uh, uh, books of literature, but also because literature develops in us a kind of uh, uh, mefiance, how do you say this? Confianza. Uh, suspicious, yeah, yeah. suspicious about the, the, the war as it is, you know? Uh, that is the reason why all the ideologies or systems that have pretended to control life entirely are very. Uh, suspicious of literature and establish uh, systems of censorship or control because they feel, and I think rightly, that in literature they have a kind of enemy of this uh, uh, appetite uh, to control everything and to organize life in such a, a, a determined, determined way. Um, uh, I think in a, in a free country, in a, in a country with uh, laws that protect the, the citizens, uh, this function of literature is not, per, is not perceived. But in any country in which freedom has, has started to shrink, I think literature immediately shows itself as something that is there to defend, you know, these basic uh, uh, human rights and, uh, and to defend the citizens against the excessive powers that can reduce our, our freedom and can even transgress our human rights. Um, and I think this aspect of, of literature is extremely, extremely important if we want to have free society, these democratic uh, countries, literature is extremely important also in a, this civic and political sense. Mm. That's, that's a wonderful way to put it, yes. Mm. 
I, I wonder um, to what extent you were um, sensitized to the whole notion of power in your experience in the military school in uh, Leoncio Prado. Uh, was, there, was, there, was there a sense then that um, there was uh, a kind of ominous uh, uh, power? Well, I, you know, Maria, I, I discovered authoritarianism when I met my father for the first time. I was 11, <laughs> I was 11 years old. Until then, my, my, my parents were divorced. And um, as my, my maternal family was very Catholic, they were ashamed of this divorce. And so he, he told me that my father was dead, you know. And one day, suddenly, when I was 11 years old, my mother told me, you know that your father is alive, no? And I think I haven't yet recovered, you know, <laughs> from the impression that I had when my mother told me that my father was alive. So I, I said, I asked it to her, and, and when I go, I go, I'm going to meet my father. And she, and, and she told me right away, immediately, we go to the hotel, and he's, he is there. And I went to live with my father. My, my father's reconciled, and my parents reconciled. And with my father, I discovered authoritarianism. He was a very authoritarian personality. Um, and I, I remember very well how my life changed completely since I went to live with my father. Uh, I discovered things that I didn't know that they exist, you know? Fear, for example. I, I had such a fear with this strange man because it was a completely strange in my life. And I think um, that the military school was just a continuation of the kind of authoritarianism that I had at home uh, because of my father. And I think the, probably it was there during those early years of my, my adolescence, you know, um, that I started to hate dictatorships, any kind of, of dictatorship. And, uh, and this, I think, has been uh, something recurrent in my life, in my writings, and uh, the way in which uh, some authorities uh, uh, exercise uh, with brutality, uh, with uh, abuse, uh, without uh, respecting, you know, the most el elementary forms in life is something that I, I cannot resist. And, and, and I think uh, this explains probably why in so many books, in so many novels, the theme of, of authoritarian power is central. It's something that has been repeating itself in, in what I have, uh, I, I have written. Because in, in, in my life, this is something that has produced in me this kind of uh, uh, protest of, of rebellion no? Again, against any kind of abuse of power. No? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're talking about power, you, and you're talking about authoritarian power, you're also talking about corruption ev eventually, and you're talking about also about rebels against the power, which is what, what you, you attribute um, the great work of literature uh, doing. But uh, you've thought deeply also about rebels. And you've, um, um, I'm talking now about Flora Tristan, for mm -hmm. instance, who the Peruvian grandmother of the artist Paul Gauguin, um, who was a feminist revolutionary and a character in your novel, uh, El Paraíso en la Otra Esquina, uh, which was the, uh, the Way to Paradise, it was in English. And I'm thinking about also Sir Roger Casement, who in a way was um, a, a rebel in his own right, the hero of Dream of the Celt. And I'm thinking too about La Retaquita, who is uh, Julieta, the heroine of your most recent book, Cinco Esquinas. And these are all people who are after some kind of truth. They are trying to right a wrong, uh, as it were, and they're bucking a whole system to do it. So rebels also, aside from power, are very much a theme in your work. Oh, without any doubt. I, this kind of characters I admire very much. Uh, 
uh, I mean, people who are not, uh, uh, who don't accept the world as it is and want to change it. Uh, uh, usually, uh, they want to change it in the good way, in the, to, to reduce sufferances, to reduce misery, to uh, defend freedom against oppression. But in certain cases, there are rebels who, are, who have a very wrong idea of uh, what they want to achieve with the, the rebellion. But it doesn't matter. Even, even if they are wrong, and even if they fail completely in what they try to do, there is something that I think is admirable in these people who are not conformist uh, and that consider that the, wo the world should change in order to be a better place, at least for some people. Uh, this kind of character I, I admire very much. And, uh, and I think uh, that is the reason why in my novels, sometimes I am not totally conscious of what I, I, I am doing. But in general, when I have a perspective of what I have done, I discover that this kind of character is recurring in my, my novels. Sometimes they came from history. In other cases, are they invented characters. But the attitude that they represent, rebellion against the world as it is, I think is something that uh, uh, I, am, I am deeply attached. And in a way, I think that this is also a consequence of, of my, my love of books of, and of literature and, and, and fiction. I think the, the books gave me since my first readings when I was uh, very young, this idea of the adventure, uh, uh, life as an adventure. Life as an adventure to change life for the better. No? Uh, I read uh, Alexandre Dumas, Le, La, the, the history of the musketeers, for example, and I remember the, the way in which I enjoy and I identified myself, you know, with the musketeers, with D'Artagnan, with Porthos, with Aramis. Uh, um, and uh, afterwards, when I, I, I started to, to, to read more important, more important books, you know, Malraux, Faulkner, the kind of heroes that were in a kind of war with the world as, as, as it is, were heroes with which I identify myself immediately. Mm. So it's not strange that I have, I have tried in my, in my novels to produce this kind of to character. To adapt no? the adventure, yes, and you do, and you do indeed. For whom do you write, Mario? For whom, who is, what you, you, what you write your fiction or your nonfiction? Do you have someone in mind? Who no, is that person? I don't think I, I, I am thinking in a reader, in a particular kind of reader when I am writing a novel. No, for me, to write a novel is something, as I repeat, very solitary. I secluded myself in, uh, in a world which came from memories, uh, images from the memory which produce inventions, which produce another images which are invented. But the point of departure is something, is always memory. Mm. Images that are uh, preserved in the memory, images that were produced by experiences, by living experiences, and then are always the point of departure for the imagination, for invention. Um, but I, I don't think I have a particular kind of reader in which I am thinking when I am writing, no. Well, what I try to do, of course, and I think this is something that many writers try to do when I, they are writing, I try to divide myself uh, in, in the, in the reader that is reading what I am writing to, to see if the, the techniques are effective and can really persuade the, the, the reader of what they, they say. But I think this is a very personal kind of, of reader. Uh, and I don't think I have a particular audience in, in mind when I am, when I am writing a book. Mm. 
it is different when I write an article or I write a, an essay. That is different because that you try to reach a kind of public, but this is not the case when I write fiction. When you write fiction, absolutely. Yes, I understand. Now you you are, uh, as we all know from from um, just listening to the ambassadors here, who have, or, or the, the the list of names who have come to to pay you tribute and to hear you, that you're a citizen of the world. You um, you have uh, you. You're Peruvian, but you live in Spain. You hold Spanish citizenship. You um, have lived in Britain. You've lived in France. And um, you were read and loved the world over. I, mean, the, the, I can't even count the number of languages that you're translated into. So my question to, to you is, um, do you think of yourself in terms of allegiance to uh, any kind of nationality, any kind of culture? Where are your allegiances? Well, uh, as, as uh, you said, I think I, I have become a citizen of the, of the world. The, particularly the world in which we live now uh, permits this kind of uh, world citizenship. Um, but I think for a writer, there are basic experiences which are the major source of his uh, fantasy of uh, when he writes. And I think in my case, these basic experiences, I, I had it when I was young, when I was an adolescent, and, uh, and probably that is the reason why, in spite of living uh, outside Peru so many, many years, I am always returning, mm -hmm. uh, directly or indirectly, to Peruvian themes, to Peruvian environments, uh, to Peruvian uh, geography, uh, and uh, to Peruvian language. No? The way in which we speak the Spanish is something that uh, is intimately linked to the kind of, write, of, of Spanish that I, 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 I write. And, uh, and I think the reason is because the, the basic experiences that form my personality were experiences that I, had, that I had in Peru when I was young. No? Mm -hmm. there, I think it was Garcia Marquez who said, um, the writer that I became was a fully formed mind, in a sense, or heart, uh, by the time he was eight years old. Um, the, the idea that you, your, those first experiences, and for you it was in, you were in Bolivia, and then you were in Piura, you were moving around as a mm -hmm. child, so you, you have this natural, um, for as long as you can remember, perhaps, a kind of fluid relationship to the world, would you say? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. And on the other hand, I, I think the, the, the basic experiences were not literary. My literary experiences are much less uh, universal, you know. I, uh, for example, I remember the way in which I was impressed uh, when I was, I don't know, 12, 13 years old, um, watching a play by Arthur Miller, uh, uh, Muerte de un Viajante, Death of a Salesman, yeah. Death, Death of a Salesman. No? Uh, and I was so impressed because it was the first play which, like a modern novel, could uh, change, you know, time, spaces in a very audacious way. And, uh, and immediately I wrote my first play after the experiences, the strong experiences, which was for me to see this, this play. And then, for example, a French writer, uh, Flaubert, marked me very, very much as a writer. I think I discovered the kind of writer that I wanted uh, to be, reading Madame Bovary. I discovered that realism was something very different of the kind of realism that was at that time in Latin America popular. Uh, not a realism that was negligible with form, with uh, aestheticism. No, on the contrary, Flaubert could match realism and uh, the research, uh, research of uh, beauty of uh, perfection, 
uh, the kind in which uh, he wore the language to reach the le mot juste, the right word, you know, was such that could match perfect realism and aestheticism. And, uh, so I, I think I, I owe enormously to foreign writers, not, not uh, uh, only Latin American, Latin American writers. It was the case of um, Faulkner, for example. I remember when I read the first novels by Faulkner, I was in, in trance. I discovered that the novel could be so rich if you use, you know, all these techniques uh, that Faulkner was using with such uh, uh, easiness uh, in, in, in his novels. Uh, uh, I remember how important it was for me to read, for example, Malraux, uh, the way in which Malraux described uh, masses, masses of people moving, acting. It was really extraordinary. And, uh, so my, my literary uh, training is much more universal. It's not Latin American. No? But the basic experiences, yes, I think Latin American and Peruvian. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In, in the symposium, Edie Grossman, your translator, mm -hmm who um, unfortunately couldn't be here, but she sent her paper. And her paper was, uh, was quite, uh, quite interesting because she said that if you weren't a novelist, you would be an archeologist. An archeologist? Yes, because your work is to sort of dig and excavate um, history, reality, and, and then she said something else very, different, very, very, very interesting, and I want you to react to it. Um, she said, not only would you be an archaeologist if you were not a writer, but that you also have this extraordinary voice that has come from Cervantes through Faulkner, and I would add Flaubert, to the work that you do, and that you're actually employing all of these, uh, these voices in what you do. So are, would you be interested in a job in archaeology, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Well, archaeology in this sense, uh, yes. But uh, to study bones, no, <laughs> I don't think so, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hope there is no archaeologist in the audience. <laughs> well, you, I am much more interested in the living world than yes. in the <laughs> world of the past. Uh, yeah. There's something else that I, I wanted to go back to Flaubert, because um, there, there's something very important um, uh, that I think connects you to Flaubert. And that is that Flaubert thought and wrote about the fact that writing is very hard work. It is, I think he said, arduous labor. And um, if you do it right, you, you, you're, uh, you don't just stop with writing a sentence, you, the, the labor comes actually after that point. Absolutely. I think that is the, the example of, of Flaubert, which is very, very encouraging. Uh, I think you, you discover with Flaubert something extremely important if you are not a born genius. If you are born a genius, no problem. But when you, when you discover that you are not a genius, this can be very discouraging for a writer, and you want to be a writer. Well, that was the case of Flaubert. Flaubert was not a genius. Flaubert started writing very bad things, you know, imitations of the fashionable writers of his time. Uh, but he wanted to be a great writer, and he decided that he would become a great writer. And as he was not a genius, he decided to replace you know, this natural force of creativity with hard work. Mm. And, uh, and this was for me extremely important, as important as to discover that realism could be, could be a kind of uh, uh, literature that at the same time was extremely formal with great preoccupation for the techniques and for the language. For the language. Uh, 
the way in which Flaubert built his talent, uh, working with such uh, obst obstinacy, with such perseverance, and, uh, uh, imposing himself, uh, imposing himself uh, kind of uh, 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 seclusion, you know, for months and for, for years, is something ex extraordinary. And he became a very great, great writer uh, without being a natural genius. And that, I think, is the great example uh, that Flaubert gave us uh, to, to the writers that we are not born genius, you know? That working very hard, being extremely self-critic of what you do, uh, being uh, obsessed with the idea of uh, improve what you have done, you can really produce uh, great, li great literature. And I think this is a f fantastic example, you know. Uh, the case of Rambaud, for example, is, is the opposite. Rambaud, when he was 40 years old, was writing masterworks, oh. poems which were absolutely revolutionary and, and perfect. And this can be very depressing if you don't have this natural force of creativity that Rambaud, Rambaud had. Well, Flaubert is much more human because it's something that working very, very hard could reach the kind of uh, originality, creativity that the natural born genius that was Rambo produced, you know? Uh, that is why I think uh, to read not only the novels of Flaubert, but the correspondence of Flaubert, particularly the letters that he wrote every day to his lover, Louis Collet, when he was writing Madame Bovary, is something absolutely extraordinary. Because you see, reading these letters, how he was able to build, to construct his talent, his, his genius, you know? Uh, working very, very hard, not accepting, you know, what he has done, uh, convinced that this could be improved, could be, could be perfect, uh, uh, perfected, you know? Uh, and I think this is something that helped me very, very much when I was writing my my first novels. You know? the, the notion that you, you need to rewrite as much mm -hmm. as you write. Yeah. Yes. Now I want to take you away from literature a little mm -hmm. bit and take you to the Mario who is the political commentator in El País. Um, we know, well, we're fortunate to live, I guess I should say, as the Chinese saying goes, in interesting times. We've, um, there's a Peruvian election afoot. Uh, we had the first uh, Primera Vuelta, the first round uh, yesterday. Um, there's a very interesting election going on in this country as well, um, as it happens. Inter it happens interesting means many different things. No? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It happens every 20 or so years, my husband tells me, so I need, I need to prepare for the next one. But um, it's been very, very uh, extraordinary, really, um, these two elections. Um, tell us your thoughts about the situation in, first in Peru. Well, it's, it's very, very interesting what's been happening in Peru since the um, uh, end of the dictatorship of Fujimori, the year 2000. Since then, we have had democratic governments, right. uh, born out of uh, free elections and uh, different kind of governments. But because there is a very large consensus in Peru in favor of political democracy, and for the first time, I would say, in, in, in our history, a large consensus about the economic policy. Uh, market economy, integration with the markets of the world. And all this has been produced an extraordinary progress in uh, material terms. Absolutely. Uh, extreme poverty has reduced dramatically. 
the middle classes have been growing, uh, uh, foreign investment is coming to Peru with enthusiasm, uh, and this has produced a real, real progress in the country. What will happen if Mr. Keiko Fujimori wins the election? She is the daughter of the dictator, one of the most corrupt dictators that we have had, and also cruel, you know, because the crimes that were committed during the Fujimori 10 years in, in power were enormous. Well, it would be a catastrophe for the country because, first of all, the triumph of Keiko Fujimori would mean a kind of revindication of the dictatorship. The dictatorship would be legitimated no? by, the elector, by the Peruvian electorate. Um, prisons in where all the Fujimoristas are uh, paying their crimes and their, uh, uh, would be free and will pass immediately to be part of the power. The division that this produce, will produce in the, in the country will be enormous. And of course, not only the, the economy, but the social uh, stability that the country has enjoyed in year 2000 will disappear. So my great hope is that uh, in this second round election, second election, will, uh, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski will, will win. It's, it will be difficult because the difference is large, but I think it's possible. My, my hope is that uh, blindness will disappear, at least in part, and Peruvians won't commit, you know, the big, big, big mistake, the uh, elect Keiko Fujimori, because I think the, the consequences will be politically and also socially and economically disastrous for Peru. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I want to take you, because we need to wrap this up, um, to your reflections from your, this grand promontory. I mean, exactly two weeks ago today, you celebrated your 80th birthday. Alas. Happy birthday. And um, a, a year before that, you said, and I, I, this is absolutely memorable, um, and I think inspirational in a way, you said, you didn't want to die dead. <laughs> you want to die living. That's what I do. And you wanted to be cut down in your stride, even as you're forging ahead, doing what it is that you do to stay alive which is to write, to live, to, com to comment, to be involved, to be a, 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 an involved person in, in this world of ours, this great world of ours that you inhabit. You know, you know, Maria, the problem is that people think that if you receive the Nobel Prize, you are already finished. This is a great <laughs> homage, but you become, you become a kind of a statue. And you won't be able to produce anything because statutes don't produce things, you know? Um, and I am doing all my best to disappoint people who believe that I have become an statute, you know? Yeah. I'm going to repeat in exactly what you said in Spanish because it's really quite beautiful. Los seres humanos a los que yo más he admirado son aquellos que resisten hasta el final y en los que la muerte es como un accidente que los sorprende en plena actividad. Absolutely. Yeah. Me gustaría morir estando vivo. Muchas de las cosas que hago, que son a veces un poco temerarias como esta, surgen de esa necesidad de seguir viviendo hasta el final, explorándolo todo. Mm -hmm. This is a living, wonderful, breathing philosophy of life, Mario. <laughs> Thank and you, Maria. Thank you very much. And we want to but, celebrate. Uh, okay. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you very much.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.